Well, good day, friends. You may be surprised to see me after I told you last week that this week we'll have Trevor Vecker again. Well, sorry about that, but here at our end, some things have changed, so it's me again. Next week, God willing, it will be Trevor Vecker again with his series from Acts. My name is Peter de Villiers, and I'm with Villiersdorp Community Church, which is in Villiersdorp, South Africa. Please have a look at the links to our other online platforms. Click on the like button and on the subscribe button and on the notification bell. And please leave a comment in the comment section. If you do this, it will help us to be more visible on YouTube. Now today I'll be reading from 1 John 2 from verse only three verses from verse 12 to 14. But first, let me pray. Father God, we come to read again from John's first letter. And as we do so, and as I speak on these verses, please help us to discern and hear everything that is in line with your word. Please use this word in our lives to the glory of your name. We pray this in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. 1 John 2 verse 12. I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. Now I've titled this message, Stand Firm 2. You may remember that the first message in this series from John's first letter was titled, Stand Firm. Now in that first message we saw that John starts his letter by stating the basics of the true Christian gospel very clearly. And in stating these basic truths, John was challenging the Christians in the church to stand firm in these truths. We saw the reason for this. And John was defending the true gospel in the face of false teachers that were confusing the church members and leading some of them away from the church and from the true gospel. And the false teachers that John was specifically targeting was the group called the Gnostics. And then in the first part of chapter 2, we've seen that John takes the false teachings of the Gnostics and corrects the falsehoods, but also presents the truths as tests of true faith. So two weeks ago, we looked at the first of these tests, namely the test of obedience. And last week, we looked at the second test of true faith, which was the test of love. Now I've titled this message, Stand Firm 2, because in verses 12 to 14, it seems as if John takes a pause. Before he gets to the next test of true faith, he seems to pause to, to emphasize again some basic foundational truths for Christians, almost as he did right at the beginning of the letter. So again, the challenge from John is to stand firm in these truths. So let's look at the verses we read and in, in these three verses John addresses um, three groupings of people. So who are they? Now in verses 12 to 14 John makes six statements about his readers and it looks like he actually has two sets of three statements in each set. And in these statements, we see that he addresses children and fathers and young men. Now, the first question that some of you may, might want to ask is, but children is gender neutral, so that's fine. But why fathers and young men? I mean, what about mothers and young women? In other words, who is John referring to with these three groupings? So let me start with the grouping that he addresses as dear children. Now this will most certainly not be literal, physical, small children. 
in the church. And we can see this in the fact that, that this phrase, dear children, is used by John no less than five times in this one chapter. And he also uses it in, in all the following chapters. And from the context of the use of this phrase in every use, we can see that John uses the phrase, dear children, to refer to all the believers. So it seems like he uses this phrase as a term of endearment and as a way of emphasizing his fatherly concern for them. Then John addresses the fathers of the, of the, in the church. Now, if, if children didn't refer to real, literal children, then we can assume the same with fathers. And the, the assumption then is that fathers refers to the wiser, more mature, and probably older Christians in the church, probably including the leaders as well. In other words, when addressing the fathers in the church, John is probably addressing those that have come some way in their spiritual walk and growth. Those that, that in a fatherly way can encourage the younger believers, which will then include the spiritually mature women as well. And then thirdly, John addresses the young men in verses 13 to 14. Now, using the same logic, this refers to the younger Christians or Christians that are younger in the faith. And as is normal with younger people, the energy and the strength of youth is still prevalent. And as such, they, they are strong and they have spiritual energy. And because of the word of God that lives in them, they have spiritual vitality and, and therefore they have overcome the evil one. In other words, John is addressing all the people in the church, whatever their physical age or spiritual age. Now, six statements from John, each with a repetition of the words, I am writing to you. So why repeat this six times? I am writing to you. Well, because John is emphasizing the importance of what he's writing. He's emphasizing that, that what he's writing are truths that have eternal value. One commentator describes this six-fold repetition of these words as follows. He says, It is the literary equivalent of hitting a mule between the eyes with a two-by-four. So John wants to drive home these foundational truths that were written as encouragement for all the believers. So what are these foundational truths? And the first truth we find in verse 12. I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. That's the first one. Now, isn't it true that sin is at the very starting point of any Christian's walk with the Lord? I mean, before trusting in Jesus as Savior, and before realizing the, the momentousness of, of Jesus' death on the cross, before all these things, there comes the realization of the need for forgiveness from God because of our sin. We see something of this in Jesus' words, as he was preparing his disciples for, for his ascension, he was leaving them. So Jesus tells them in John 16, verse 7 and 8, But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. That's the Holy Spirit. And when he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. And this is exactly what happened. I mean, on the day of Pentecost, in, in the first sermon, after the Holy Spirit was sent to the world, we have Peter preaching the gospel message. And, and his listeners were evidently deeply convicted of their sin. Now we see their response in Acts 2 verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, 
for the forgiveness of your sins. And yeah, now today in our passage, John reassures his readers that your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. In other words, never take this blessing for granted. Because your sins are forgiven, but not because you passed the tests of true faith with your obedience and love, but because of Jesus who took your punishment on himself. So that's the first foundational truth. The second foundational truth that we find here are in verses 13 and 14. There we read, you know him who is from the beginning. And then verse 14, you know the father. And again, you know him who is from the beginning. In other words, they know the father and the son. Now you see, when we know that our sins are forgiven by God, then we get to know him as our loving father for instance when the prodigal son uh, came home repenting his father ran up to him and hugged him and kissed him and his rebellion forgiven and forgotten and in the same way god forgives our sin and we then become part of his family with him as our father you see knowing god as father implies that you are his child and again, it is the Holy Spirit that does this work in us. We read in Romans 8 verse 15, The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your, your adoption to sonship, and by Him we cry, Abba, Father. So John refers to Jesus as the one who was from or in the beginning. This is how he starts this letter in chapter 1 verse 1. This is also how he starts his gospel. And, and with this description of Jesus, he emphasizes that Jesus has always been, he will always be, therefore he's God and he's eternal. So why, it's why is it important to know this? Well, we saw two weeks ago that Jesus is our advocate with the Father. And this advocacy does not end. Hebrews 7 verse 25 says it like this, Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him, because he always lives to intercede for them. And his love also doesn't end. Jeremiah 31 verse 3, The Lord appeared to us in the past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love i've drawn you with unfailing kindness of course knowing god and jesus is the purpose of the gospel we read in john 7 verse 17 verse 3 no now this is eternal life that they know you the only true god and jesus christ whom you have sent and then we get to the third foundational truth that we also find in verses 13 and 14, with the same words repeated in both verses. You have overcome the evil one. Now, of course, some churches teach that you can only have victory over sin if, if we experience what is often called a, a second blessing. But John is teaching the opposite here. Paul writes in Romans 6 that a Christian is someone who has died to sin and who no longer lives under its dominion. And John says, yeah, that someone who has become a Christian, even a young Christian, the reign of sin is broken. Yes, we still struggle with sin and we fall into sin and we fail. But through the knowledge of God's word and by the work of the Holy Spirit, we are gradually enabled to live for God in this world. We saw this during the, the, the past two weeks when we looked at the process of sanctification in the two weeks we've just had. And in John 14, John gives the reason why this has happened. He says in verse 14, Because you are strong and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Now, the writer of Psalm 119 understood something about this. 
he writes in verses 9 and 11, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So John wants all Christians not to forget and to be encouraged because your sins have been forgiven. And secondly, because you know God is your Father and Jesus who will always be there for you. And thirdly, because the Word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. Now why did John think that it was necessary to take this pause and reaffirm these basic yet fundamental gospel truths? Well, I believe that there are two reasons for this. Firstly, in the verses that come just before today's verses, which we've looked at the last two weeks, John was dealing with the tests of true faith. So if you missed these messages, they're on our YouTube channel. Just search for Fleersdorp Community Church. And the first test was obedience to God. And the second test was that of, of love toward each other. And the problem is that when looking at these tests, we will always find that we actually don't pass the test. And it's possible that, that John realized that his readers perhaps especially the, the weaker readers, may feel overwhelmed by the tests of true faith that is given to them thus far. Perhaps some of, them, some of them may lose hope because they see no possibility of meeting the standards that John has been setting. And in these verses, he, he now encourages his readers by reminding them what they have in Christ. He reminds them, yeah, of of what God has done for them and what they have taken possession of when coming to faith. So as he did at the beginning of chapter 1 and again at the beginning of chapter 2, here again he grounds his readers in the truths of the gospel. But then the second reason for this pause is the teachings of the false teachers, the Gnostics. When it comes to what they believed, nothing has changed today. I mean, so John reaffirms to his readers and to us that your sins have been forgiven. Now, of course, the Gnostics taught that sin doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all because God only deals with your spirit and your deeds were done in the flesh. So it doesn't matter. Now, what about today? You know, in so many churches today, even things that, that the Bible points out as sin aren't seen as sin. Just in this past week, referring to the gender revolution and specifically to homosexuality, a minister from another church said to me, but that's not really what is meant by the passages on the subject. Now, this is someone who says that he believes the Bible. This is someone who preaches from the pulpit here in Fleersdorp. And we have to be very careful who we allow to teach us. And then secondly, John reaffirms to his readers that, and to us that you know God is your Father and Jesus who will always be there for you. Jesus who is eternal and therefore who is God. Now, of course, the Gnostics twisted who God is and who Jesus is. The Gnostics believed that Jesus isn't God. They taught that he was just a man who lived and died as, as other men do. Oh, what about today? Well, at the seminary where I studied long ago, a professor was suspended for heresy. But just in the past December, he was restored as a theologian and minister in the church, even though... Like the Gnostics, he doesn't believe that Jesus is God. And all over the country there are ministers in pulpits that, that studied under this professor and his heretical teaching that, that Jesus isn't God. And then thirdly, John reaffirms to his readers and to us that God's word lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. 
Well, the Gnostics didn't believe that they had any sin that needed forgiveness or overcoming. So you'd want to ask them, but why then did Jesus have to die? Surely that indicates that sin is something serious? Well, way back when I was at seminary, one lecturer taught us that you don't preach the do's and the don'ts in the Bible. You only preach on what God has done for us. In other words, only the sweet bits. Only the bits that actually don't challenge you at all and allow you to live life as you please. Only the bits that talk about God's love for you. None of the bits about God's holiness and his, his hatred of sin. None of the bits about judgment that is coming. Well, I'm so grateful for people in my life that kept me grounded in the whole Bible. But so many of my peers are in pulpits on Sundays, always speaking only about God's love, but never about sin and judgment. This is prevalent all over. And we should know about these things. You see, there are many ministers in churches that only preach on the juicy bits in the Bible. And just like John's first readers, we need to be reminded of and grounded in the basic truths of the gospel regularly. We need to have ears that are discerning. We need to hear when what is taught is not the true gospel message, the whole gospel message. So today John emphasizes, your sins have been forgiven. You know God as your Father and Jesus who will always be there for you. Jesus who is God. And God's word lives in you and therefore you have overcome the evil one. Let me pray. Father God, thank you for the reminder that our sins have been forgiven. Lord Jesus, thank you for always being there um, as our advocate with the Father. Holy Spirit, thank you for your work in us to see ourselves and our sin for what it is. Thank you for revealing the Father and the Son to us so that we can know them. Holy Spirit, please give us a love for and a passion for God's Word. Help us to have God's Word living in us. Help us to overcome the evil one every day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning, Next week, God willing, it will be Trevor Vicker, I'm sure. As a song for today, I want to suggest the same song I had two weeks ago. It is the song, There Is One Gospel, and it is sung by City of Light. I'm suggesting the song again because it just fits in so well with today's message. There's a link to it in the description below, and there's an on-screen link next to me. God willing... I'll be with you again in two weeks, That, in, in other words, on the 25th of February 2024. Until then, God bless and goodbye.